Amen. Hallelujah. Wow, you guys have good decibels here. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, it's such a joy, such a delight, such a privilege to be here tonight. I'm really excited, and I want to celebrate uh, my pastor, Pastor Goldman, and my pastor, Pastor Bola, for giving me this opportunity. Please help me celebrate our lead pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and it's always such a pleasure to hang out with all of my friends, all the associate pastors and, and, and um, the leaders, Pastor TJ, Pastor Emmanuel, uh, Pastor Posh, Pastor Samson, and all the other pastors who are not seated. And of course, uh, with me is my uh, assistant resident pastor, Pastor Bola Adisa, here tonight. Uh, I'm happy to announce to you that uh, uh, your baby has started eating solid food. Uh, the Elevation Church mainland is doing very well. We give God praise for all that he's doing. And uh, we celebrate God for our new baby, uh, the Greater Lekki Church. Uh, we thank God for all that he's doing. And I want to say hi to you out there. Um, I hope we're going to have a very, very fantastic time tonight. Amen. Are you ready to dive into God's word? All right. So we, we, we're having a conversation that um, started at the beginning of this month where we um, God started challenging us to live beyond ourselves. And um, uh, in our midweek services, we've been examining uh, good works. Uh, we started with, you know, um, the fact that it's important that God requires us uh, to bear fruit uh, in, in form of good works. And our anchor scripture for that has been in the book of Matthew, uh, the fifth chapter, and uh, starting from 13 verse. Of course, you know that on the mainland center, we, we run the same set of teachings. So, uh, we are very, very aligned. Would you open your Bible this evening to the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 5, and I'll take my reading from verse 13. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for all that you are set to do in this place tonight. I ask, Lord, that you have your way. Open the eyes of our understanding. Help us to receive that which you have for us today. Let us live here inspired, strengthened, instructed in wisdom, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Jesus, uh, speaking here, uh, started by saying, you are the light of the earth. I'm reading the New King James Version. You, sorry, you are the salt of the earth. I'm reading the New King James Version. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing. Somebody say good for nothing. Is it not interesting that good for nothing came from the Bible? Uh, so he says, it's then good for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, he says, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Uh, I'm going to start by just, you know, exegeting a bit on this scripture, and then we would begin to examine how God expects us, God demands of us uh, to go do good works in the workplace. Now, Jesus started by saying here that you are the salt of the earth, and that salt cannot afford to lose its flavor. What makes salt useful? What makes salt valuable? is the fact that it has the capacity to flavor. So the question one would then ask is, uh, if you are the salt of the earth, if you want to sort of personalize this, what is your flavor? Uh, what is it that you bring to the table that makes you useful? What is it that you must be careful not to lose? Because if you lose it, the Bible says you will be good for nothing. That when people begin to treat you like trash, when people stop placing value on you, when people begin to look down on you, when people begin to you know, sort of devalue you, what is it that you've lost? What is it that you are not stewarding appropriately that causes people to do that? You need to find out what it is. Because Jesus says that happens when salt loses its flavor. That when salt loses its flavor, it is good for nothing. And that immediately begins to say that your relevance starts with your capacity to contribute. Because salt is not meant to salt itself. Salt is meant to flavor something. And so your value uh, is, you know, is driven by your capacity to, to contribute. What you possess, the things that you have, is for other people. 
when you do not discover and steward it appropriately, when you don't release it, the Bible says you are good for nothing. And when you keep it to yourself, people are not able to perceive your value, so they're, they, they, they're free to treat you anyhow. Praise God. Another thing we need to recognize about what Jesus said is that obviously the value of salt is, uh, is received through contact. You know, salt cannot salt in isolation. You're meant to uh, engage other people. People are meant to receive from you. And in order for people to receive of you, you must make contact. You must mingle. You must interact, right? You must engage. There must be some form of transaction that enables people to receive uh, that, of that gift, of that talent, of that unique ability that God has placed in you. But it's important for you to recognize what it is you have. And it's important for you to steward it. So Jesus says, you are the salt. You are the salt. And so it is your responsibility to understand that you bring flavor to this world. Everybody here has something that God has given you uh, to contribute to uh, the development of others, to the well-being of others, to the success of, of others, uh, to the increasing level of excellence and order on this planet. And as you do that, you, you, people appreciate the value that you bring to the table. Now, it goes further to say you are the light of the world. And there is a distinction between uh, what Jesus said when he was uh, defining us as salt and light. He wasn't, was not necessarily repeating itself himself. Uh, you need to appreciate what he was trying. He was trying to discuss two distinct uh, um, attributes of believers. Uh, so he says, "You are the light of the world." Now, when you think about the concept of being the light, the, so the article, "You are the light," you are not a light. You are the light. It means the world does not have light. You are the light of the world. It is you that lights the world. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, of course, I'm sure you know that scripture. Uh, uh, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has risen upon you. For darkness covers the earth, and gross darkness the people. So, Jesus says here, it is you that brings light to the world. It is you. There is a way, uh, as believers, we are meant to live our lives that completely differentiates us from the rest of the world. And that is what makes us light. Now it goes further to say, he says, you are the light of the world, and a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. So Jesus was saying, because you are the light of the world, you cannot be hidden. It, it didn't say you will not be hidden. You know there's a difference between something that you will not do and something that you cannot do. What you will not do is a function of uh, your willingness and unwillingness. But if I say you cannot do something, it means you lack the ability. Jesus said, Light cannot but be visible. Light cannot but be visible. Because you are the light of the world, because you are believers, the way you are meant to live as a believer, uh, the, the, the expression of your faith and the manifestation of the, of the fruit of the Spirit in your life is, is designed to make you stand out. You are the light. You are the, you are the one that brings hope. You are the one that brings illumination to the world. The world is in darkness. The way we live our lives as Christians makes us light. So Jesus was saying here, uh, yes, you have gifts, talents, and abilities that enable you to flavor the earth, but you also need to recognize that there's something other than that that you possess, that your lifestyle, your character, the, the nature of God that you exude, that is not talent. It's just the nature of God that, that, you, that you reflect uh, it distinguishes you. It, gives, it inspires people. It brings hope. So he says, a city that is set upon a hill cannot be hidden, it says, no, do they light a lamp? You, you, you don't light a lamp and hide it, but you put it on a lamp stand. You make it visible because it is meant to give light to all who are in the house. So Jesus was saying here, recognize who you are. You're meant to live differently. You're meant to, uh, you're, you're meant to lead others. You're meant to inspire others. You're meant to, to give others direction. He then says, let your light. So it begins to uh, unfold. He says, let your light so shine before men. Let this light you possess so shine before men that they may see what the, your good works and glorify your Father that is in heaven. Let this light shine. You know, get, let it shine by nature, by new birth, by, re, by virtue of your relationship with me. You are the light of the world. Praise God. I was having a conversation with my kids uh, like a week or so ago. You know, they, they were in our room and you know, I was just gisting with them. I was talking to, uh, to them about how you need to uh, live true to your convictions, you know, and, and honor God with your decisions and all of that. And my daughter said, look, I have a question for you. I said, I said what is the question? And she says, you know what, it's, it's, she's 10 years old, so, you know, she says, you know, right now in school, it is not cool to be honest. It's not cool 
to not have gutter tongues, you know, gutter, what, you know what I mean, swear words, use swear words, you know, insult people. It's not cool for you to not have, as a girl in class, for you to not have gossip, you know, that when your friends walk up to you and say, what's happening? You need to have fresh gossip. You need to have something. When you don't have stuff like that to share, they just see you as you are boring. Uh, people don't gravitate towards people like that. They, they, you need to know the latest worldly song. You need to have some gossip about what's going on between some girl and some boy in class. You know, you need to be hot like that to have friends. And she was like, so when you try to stay clear of all of that, you just find out that you're sort of on, alone. You, you don't have friends. People don't want to hang around you. And, you, you know, it can be a bit of pressure, she says. And I said to her, well, so, so that is what, you know, the word of God uh, means when he says that, you know, you are, you are the light of the world. You know, because the world is always dark. And you've got to stand out. You've got to stand out. But the question is, would you succumb to the pressure to compromise because you want to blend in? Or are you going to stand out and honor God and be so attractive that others will want to be like you? That, that is the big question. Are you going to live true to what you believe? Are you going to live true to your convictions? Are you, go, are you willing to stand alone? Are you willing to honor God uh, in isolation until others see the fruit of your life and begin to gravitate in your direction? Praise God. So we, we need to understand that we, that is God's expectation of us, that we will salt the earth and we will light the world. It's not, it's not conditional. By nature, this is how we are meant to function. Now, this then takes me to the workplace. You know, uh, which is the focus of my conversation with us this evening. But before I dive into that, let me quickly say this, that it is also important for us to recognize that uh, when I look at Christians and I see how at times uh, people struggle uh, with um, God's plan for their lives, uh, how things begin to unfold uh, through the seasons and the times, there are certain things I've come to understand. And uh, I realize that it's it's nearly impossible for you to sit down and by yourself construct your path to true success, uh, to true fulfillment of God's purpose and assignment for your life. It's just, it's just impossible because there are so many, uh, the pathway to it is not, is not visible. And there is a concept I've come to uh, appreciate. Uh, it's a marketplace concept, but it's a, it's a spiritual principle that when we don't understand, places a limit on how much of God we experience and how much opportunity escapes us. You see, it's like God has designed into our daily lives opportunities for us to do good, opportunities for us to be a blessing to people, opportunities for us to add value. And locked into those opportunities are, you know, uh, our breakthroughs, our opportunities for increase, our opportunities for supernatural help, our opportunities for unusual liftings, such that it's like, there are times when the door that will lead you to your biggest doors in life are usually very old, like old wooden doors that are not attractive in nature. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Now, <laughs> what that does is that it is possible for you to walk past your opportunity and not see it. If you want to, if you want to pick which of God's instruction you will be. If you're going to pick, so if, if Joseph had walked past those guys who had a dream that, that night, uh, they had a nasty dream, and, you know, what's his business? Right now, he's, he's feeling bad about how uh, Potiphar's house has treated him, and he's in his own world, and he's trying to sort out how he's going to get out of this prison. And he, he didn't really care that they had dreams and was willing to sit down and encourage them. Well, he would have lost that opportunity. If the widow of Zarephath was so caught up in her survival and the survival of her daughter, of our son, and would not care about the prophet, you know, and, and said, this guy is, this old bearded guy is just, uh, he's just a fraud, you know what, just get out of my sight. Well, she would have lost the opportunity to be fed throughout the famine season. And you see stories like that again and again in the scripture, uh, that in our decisions to honor God's word, to live by the principles of God's word, the, the, those things are locked in there. And so there's, there's a concept of what you call lost opportunities. Now, the, the challenge with lost opportunities is that you cannot quantify them. And I want you to listen very carefully to me. You cannot quantify a lost opportunity because you don't know what it will have translated to. So say, for instance, I, 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 I and, and, and if, you, if you lead a business and you understand what I'm trying to say, if you lose a customer or you lose a transaction, it is not just that transaction you've lost. Um, your, in your books, you're, not, you're never really going to be able to quantify 
the opportunities that transaction will have presented. So whether that opportunity will have translated to another contract, to so some relationship that will have translated to another opportunity, that will have led to another door opening, you just don't know. You can't quantify it. And, and so it's, it's important for us to be careful how we live our lives. That when I choose to walk by an opportunity to help someone, because my perception of that is it's just going to slow me down, or well, how does it affect me? Well, you don't know the opportunities that you have lost. Because interpreting somebody's dream was actually supposed to be my pathway to the palace. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I want you to know tonight that uh, even though, you know, good works, you know, are not, it, it, it helps us to extend the love of God to other people, helps us to um, reach out to people and show them God's love. In doing good to others, inside that those acts of goodness and sowing seeds of goodness are the secrets of our own breakthroughs. You understand what I'm saying? That oftentimes where you see the supernatural power of God uh, manifest is not necessarily in just doing your job very well. It's in, a, it's in releasing yourself to God to be a blessing to people. Uh, going out of your way to, to uh, do stuff that doesn't have uh, um, how would I put it? There's, there's no direct benefit to you but you're willing to allow, allow God to use you to touch someone, to bless someone, to show a seed to someone's life. And that you can't game that system. It has to be your lifestyle for it to produce for you. You know what I mean by gaming it? Maybe if I do good to this person, uh, that's where it will come from. Well, you don't get to choose that. Praise God. That's why the Bible just says, do good to all men. Love all men. Honor everybody. You can't be selectively nice. That means you are not nice. Praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. So we need to understand, that has to be the foundation of our thinking that, look, I, if I will succeed in life, I must recognize that people are my opportunities. People represent my opportunities. Now, the workplace happens to be a place where, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, or the marketplace generally is where we use our competencies to create value and get financial rewards and other opportunities. So when, I, when, I'm, when I'm in a, when I'm in a work, workplace, when I'm in the marketplace, I use my competences, my skill sets to create value, and I get rewarded uh, financially. I also get rewarded uh, with other opportunities, opportunity for new transactions, opportunity for promotion, opportunity for you know, capacity development, whatever it is. But I bring my competences to the table. Now, the truth is that the workplace is guided by contracts and agreements that sort of demand certain deliverables from you. Am I right? So yes, in the workplace, I have, a, I have a, an employment letter. In, in this transaction, there is a contract that holds me to perform certain things, to do certain things in order to uh, be qualified to receive payment or whatever, or whatever kind of, you know, whatever the nature of the transaction. And so a lot of times when we get into those kind of places and we get into those kind of uh, systems, we are often focused on the transaction itself. Uh, I need to get to work at 8 o'clock, work till 5, deliver on all my deliverables. At the end of a month, I get my salary. If I do well, um, down the line, a year after I, I, I'm appraised, I get promotion. If I execute this contract very well, well, um, I'm going to get all my, my, my payments through, and I have an opportunity to get another job. So essentially, when we get into the marketplace, oftentimes we can easily get locked into the terms of our contracts, and uh, the conditions of engagement uh, becomes our focus. And we lose sight of opportunities to impact lives positively and add value to people. So this night, I'm not here to talk to you about come to work early because your contract holds you to that. If you don't do that, you're dishonest. That's not good works. Coming to work early is not good works. Coming to work early is your responsibility. You understand? Doing your job well is not good works. Doing your job well is why they recruited you. And that's why you're going to get salary for it. Right? Yeah, honoring in terms of delivering on the contract is not a good work. Delivering on your contract is a function of the perception of your capacity that your, uh, your customer has of you uh, that got you the contract in the first instance, and it is your responsibility because they can sue you if you don't deliver. So it's not, a, it's not a good work. It is your responsibility. When you don't do that, you are not a person of integrity, period. Praise God. So I'm not here to talk to you about honoring contracts. Um, it's important. Um, it's a sign of, you know, the fact that you fear God and that you respect agreement, right? But I'm saying uh, that is not why God, men glorify your God. It's just you being responsible and honoring the terms of your agreement, and you need to keep to that. 
I, I'm here to take the conversation a bit further to say, uh, while you pay attention to all of those things and, and align yourself to the requirements of, of your job or your contract, it's important for you to recognize that God has placed you there also for a higher purpose. Opportunities to impact lives positively and add value to people. Praise God. You know that it's very possible for you to be on a job, on a contract, and you're executing superbly, but you have a very horrible love work. You get what I mean? Yeah, that you have a very horrible, that you, you're, you're not, you don't care about people, that you don't see people. At times it's not that you don't care about people, it's just that people are invisible to you, you don't see people. I don't mean that you don't know that you're working with people. There's a difference between I'm working with people, I talk to people, there's a difference between that and seeing people. Uh, my wife has helped me to understand the difference. You know, my, my wife is very quick to see people. I'm slower uh, at seeing people. Uh, so what, I, what, what it means is, is say, for instance, they, uh, they change the security man at our gate and all that. My wife would be the first to, she, she would know his name. Uh, she, would, uh, she would see the opportunity to um, give that person something and really just engage. She, she, at times when she talks to me about people in the church, I know she sees people. She would be like, you know, this thing would be good on this person. I was just thinking of blessing this person with this. She sees people. She can immediately, very quickly connect to your reality. Where are you at? What are you dealing with? What are your aspirations? What are your desires? You know, what are you about? Uh, some of us are slower. We, we see heads and nose and mouth and ear. We just see, we recognize that there's a human being and that we're, we're interacting. But I don't see you. You understand what I'm, what I'm saying? I don't see you. I don't feel you. Uh, and, you know, that... that impacts our ability to develop any measure of empathy or to see the need to, to, to resource or to connect or to engage at any level. Because we just see human beings and we see those people as, um, as tools and resources or as you know, a population where we ought to, team we ought to engage with to get the job done. Praise God. It's always still with me this, this afternoon. So when we, 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 we need to recognize the fact that God has giving us opportunity in the marketplace where we spend most of our time actually to impact lives positively and to add value to people. And that we need to be careful to uh, pay attention to our love work, pay attention to what God is saying to us about those people because God loves them. God has ideas about them. the things God wants to do in their lives. Uh, and you are close enough to be a vessel that God can use to start something, to sow a seed, to, to open uh, them up to certain realities or to meet their needs. Praise God. So how do we get ourselves to the point where as believers in the marketplace we can uh, be consistent and intentional about good works? I'm going to speak about a couple of things that are barriers to uh, consistently uh, doing good at the workplace, doing good works at the workplace. What I think is that, that can distort our disposition. Number one is when in the workplace we see our colleagues as our competition, it becomes really quite difficult for you to want to do good to someone you see as a competition because um, for you life is a zero-sum game. If they win, I lose. If I, must, if I must win, they must lose. Are we together? When you have that orientation um, you become blind to opportunities to really do good, to really see that person and to be a blessing to someone who you see as a competitor because you always want to outdo your competitor. In a football match, you know, for you to leave the field satisfied, your opponent must lose the match. So it is going to be very rare for you to see a player pass the ball to his opponent intentionally. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Because the opponent is supposed to lose that match. So when you see your colleagues as competi competition, it, it already impacts your ability to see them as people who God has sent you to. If you have a ladder climber outlook, you know, the ladder climbing person who you define, I'm here to, to become the, uh, um, I want to become the senior manager in the next two years, and that's all I'm about. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just a, the ladder climbing kind of person. All my, my, my outlook is about my career goal and how I want to move swiftly. When, you are, when that is all that consumes you, you would, you would use people. Um, you would, you, you would um, take advantage of people. 
there's nothing wrong with desiring to put your career on the fast track. I'm not saying that. I mean, we encourage that you do that. But if that is what consumes you, if that is all that you're about, you will not see people. You are not going to, you're not going to be able to pause. You're always going to be looking for opportunities that give you visibility, opportunities that, that shows, showcases your ability and your capacity. Um, even when you are nice to people, it is, you are just manipulating the system. You actually have an end. It's not genuine. You get what I'm trying to say? You're trying to work the system to aid you. And there are times when you need to catch ourselves thinking like that because it impacts how God is able to use us at the workplace. You know, that I, I need to slow down and say to myself, but God wants to really, I need to genuinely love people. I need to genuinely care about people. I need to be willing to do stuff for people when there is, there is no obvious benefit for me. I need to be willing to go out of my way. And if I'm the ladder climbing type person, it just becomes difficult. Another obstacle to that is where you are the, you know, tit for tat person. Very Old Testament in your outlook. Where, you know, if this person is nice to me, I'm going to be nice to her. If she's, if he's nasty to me, I'm going to show him I didn't come to this Lagos account bridge either. You know, that kind of thing. So, I, I, I don't take nonsense from anybody. Uh, when, you are, when, you are, when you have that outlook, the, the challenge also is you would come across as a Pharisee who would love you know, um, anyone that is nice, like Jesus is, and then, you know, you detest anyone that comes across as, you know, not so nice. And your justification will essentially be, well, since he's not such a nice person, why would I, you know, why, why am I, I'm not this person's doormat. I'm not going to allow this person to do this. But the Bible says you should love all men. Owe no man nothing except love. So a tit-for-tat outlook is, also speaks to what is festering in you. That if somebody is bad, their badness is not your own excuse for nastiness. Somebody's badness is not your own excuse for nastiness. Because when nastiness proceeds from you, it means there is nastiness in you already. Okay? And then, uh, number, uh, this would be number four, right? Uh, that's inability to recognize, to see God in people. Uh, you know, wh when, when you look at people, what do you see? Uh, what do you see? The Bible says we're made in his image and after his nakedness. What do you see? Do you see God or you see the devil? Uh, or do you, you just see flesh? Do you see potential? Do you see possibility? Do you see hope? Do you see someone who can be a lot better? Do you see someone who's struggling? Do you see, you know, what, what, what do you see? You know, can you see the person the way God sees that person? Uh, it's something as believers we need to cultivate. God loves everybody. I tell people, God loves everybody. That you broke up with a guy doesn't mean God has stopped loving him. No, 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 no. You may have stopped loving him. God loves that person. That, the, that you, a lady broke your heart doesn't mean God has stopped loving the person. I don't know whether you get what I'm saying. No. I understand it's painful, and I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to rub it in or make you feel bad. I'm just saying God doesn't stop loving people because they were bad to you or because of, you know, where they are right now in their life. Uh, that that boss is very cross doesn't mean God hates him. God loves everybody. And you need to get to the place in your life where you need to come to terms with that. It may be hard for you when you look at some people and say, why should God love this person? I wish God would join me in hating him. <laughs> You know, but, <laughs> um, excuse me, sir. Remember that there was a time when you were also lost in sin, and God loved you all the same. So it's important for us to love and see, and see God in people, and see people through God's lenses that, you know, why is this person so difficult to deal with? Why is this person so, you know, what is, what is the issue, you know? Can God just help me to see what the person is dealing with? Where is he struggling? Why, why is he so warped in his character? Is there an um, upbringing issue? Is there a frustration in his life? Why is this person so difficult? Can I begin to trust God to play a part? Maybe I just need to buy the person the book or pray for the person. Or just be the person that constantly smiles at him or her, even though she, she's never really willing to engage in, in, in any, you know, uh, um, she's not willing to engage in any niceties. But I, I choose to be pleasant to this person. Okay? And, and the last one, I spoke about it earlier, um, is just that you lack empathy, capacity to see people, you know, and, and be in people's, you know, put yourself in people's position, be proximate enough to understand where they're coming from, you know. Hallelujah. Uh, so, again, uh, I'm moving very fast. I hope you're, you're able to keep up with me. Uh, there's a mindset that enables us to do good works in the workplace. So, I've, I've run you through this so that you can sort of begin to ask yourself, where am I? What are the, what are the issues I am? I'm currently dealing with uh, what is what is what is my attitude in the workplace what drives me how do I see my, my work environment when I'm promoted do I see myself as someone who's God has sent 
to influence things, to enable others to flourish, or I just see it as an opportunity for me to exercise my influence and to con continue to consolidate on my power and influence and you know, use that to give my career you know, greater thrust. What is, how do I interpret what is happening to me in the marketplace? You know, and what room do I give God to walk through my life? So there's a, that, that, there's, a, that, that, there's a mindset that enables good works in the marketplace. And the first is that you must start by recognizing that there is a ministry in your career. Uh, you, you, that you, have to, you have to come to terms with the fact that in my, in my career, there's ministry in it. That God is moving me around. He's, he's giving me new opportunities. He's, he's, he brought me into this new organization. He's giving me this level of influence not just to make money, but also to you know, spread the influence of his kingdom. There is ministry in my career. I must recognize that there is a ministry in that career. And that that mindset causes you to open your heart to God for instructions. Praise God. So that when you enter the marketplace, your mind is not locked up. Like, I, God can't talk to me about anybody. This is marketplace. No, there is ministry in this career. There is ministry in this business I'm running. And so I'm careful to allow God to speak to me about people, to speak to me about issues, to open my, my, my eyes to opportunities to intervene, to solve problems, to, to resource people, to mentor people, to give my time to help people when it has nothing to do with the contract and the agreement that I've signed. Number two is that you need to be someone who prays to God uh, to enable you to see opportunities to bless lives and add distinctive value. I, I was speaking to my friend a couple of years ago. I was still very active in the marketplace then. And, you know, my, my career had, had experienced some waves of promotion that I thought was quite rapid. And this, my other friend, has also, had also experienced, you know, uh, such peace. And I said to him, we need to begin to pray to God and ask him, why is this happening at this time in our lives? I believe that it is not just to us to live a more comfortable life. I think that there's something that God wants to do through us, uh, and we need to pay attention to it, that this is actually an opportunity to do ministry. It may be that God is giving influence in, the, in, the, in that organization to begin to shape more uh, employee-friendly policies, not to join management in frustrating employees. It may be that God is giving you that influence because he knows that you're going to steal what that influence in how you relate to other people and you're going to point them to him. Praise God. And so, pray to God to enable you to see opportunities to bless lives. Don't recognize the fact that when you are in an organization and people are complaining, when you join those that are complaining, you are not, you are not becoming the light. You are uh, joining the darkness. The question you should ask yourself is, how do I fix this complaint? What is my role in addressing this? What can I do? How can I how can I contribute to this change? It's not, yeah, it's not in my JD, but now that I'm in this organization, there is enough uh, uh, of, of God in me to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. So there was a time when uh, the book of Daniel, I believe it's the second chapter, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he called all the wise men and said to them, uh, I had a dream, and I want to get to interpret. And I said, okay, so tell us the dream interpret. I said, look, I've forgotten the dream, so you will need to tell me the dream and interpret. And he said to him, but this is madness. We, we, we can't, how do we tell you the dream? And interpret. We don't know what the dream is. You tell us the dream. And the king got mad and said, I'm going to kill all the wise men. And everybody went to town. Uh, Daniel, the Bible says, with these uh, three other Hebrew boys, that, uh, Shedrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they asked uh, one of the king's uh, soldiers, why is the king's commandment so hasty, they say? And uh, why is he? So, and he said, look, this is what has happened, and this is what. So Daniel stepped up and goes to the king and says, king, we can fix this problem. Give us some time. Okay? Give us some time. And he took time out and began to pray to God. Pray to God. And Bible says, and then God visited Daniel and I showed him the vision and gave him the interpretation. And then I was able to go to the king and give him the interpretation. The truth is, because you're a believer, there is a dimension that you can visit that enables you to be part of the solution in your organization. The question is whether you are even aware that that access exists that you are not as ordinary as some of your other colleagues, and that you can always leverage the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life to create outstanding value for your uh, organization or for your colleagues. So Daniel reached out to God and said, God, you know all things. This is humanly impossible, but I know that you can fix this. And I'm asking you to reveal to me what this is. It looks impossible, but let's solve this problem together. And God visited him. Somebody here tonight, you need to enter into that dimension. Recognize that you are with God. 
and that in that organization, God wants you to shine. That when those issues are raging and those problems are there, maybe you are sent there for such a time as this, that your light will shine, that you'll be able to harness the wisdom of God and the power of God and, 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 and the, the, the counsel of the Holy Spirit to, to solve the problem. Hallelujah. Number three is that you need to recognize that some of your supernatural experiences, if, <laughs> as a believer, if you want to put your career on the fast track, as a believer, with all the odds that are stacked against you, you don't want to lie, you don't want to bribe, you don't want to connive with anybody. You want to, if you want to put your career on the fast track, the supernatural has to feature. I'm serious. The supernatural just has to feature. And I can, I can share my own testimonies, but the time is not uh, ticking in my fever right now. Look, uh, so we see that in the life of, of Joseph. We see that in the life of Daniel. That you need to recognize that some of the supernatural experiences you will have in your career will be because you put yourself in a position where God had to show up for you. Position where you were willing to serve, you were willing to help. Someone got in trouble and you didn't join them to, 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 to nail the person's coffin. But you were willing to, to, to support, you were willing to, you know, Think through how the mess in this contract can be resolved. And you were willing to go pray about it. You were willing to invest your heart in it. You were willing to, you know, talk to that, your boss who is leading a contract and who's going through a divorce at the same time or having a tough time in a relationship and the person's hand is no longer steady. And you're not waiting for the person to drop the ball so they can condemn the person, but you will rush in to say, you know what, I can help you. I know I have my table is full right now, but I know, I know that you're going through something and how can I help? That you're not going to be a spectator in the workplace, but you will be someone that... You would commit to allow God to use him or her in the workplace. That you, you posture yourself such that God's supernatural power can manifest in the workplace. Praise God. Because your greatest opportunities are actually woven into the fabric of your good works. You need to write that down. Your greatest opportunities are woven into the fabric of your good works. Your greatest opportunities are woven into the fabric of your good works. That and when you see the scripture, I, I, took, I gave you the example of Joseph, I gave you the example of Daniel now, you will see that again and again, that oftentimes the, that factor that creates that quantum leap, that sudden, you know, uh, search upward in the lives of people is not in the path of just doing your work well. Praise God. It's, it's, it's something you encounter in the place of selfless service. Commitment to helping others and loving other people and reaching out to support and to help. Praise God. And so the Bible says, you know, concerning a woman, uh, her name is Dorcas in the book of Acts chapter 9 from verse 36 to 40. I read the amplified version, Acts 36 to 40. It said, now there was a Joppa, a disciple Believer, a woman named Tabitha, which in Greek means Dorcas. And I love what the Bible says. It says she was abounding in good deeds. This woman was abounding in good deeds. She, she just she, she loved on people. She did good stuff. She enjoyed doing good deeds to people. And the Bible says about that time she fell sick and she died. And when they had cleaned her, they laid her in the upper room. And since Lydia was near Joppa, however, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, begging him, do come to us without delay. You know some people, when they die, they say, praise God. Hey, hallelujah. This woman, wicked woman. <laughs> I've been praying for her to go. This, this guy, this woman was dead. They cleaned her and they went to send disciples because Peter was nearby, begging him to come. So this was the point where Dorcas was helpless. She's gone. But there are some people who felt we still need this woman around. So they begged him and said, do come to us without delay. So Peter immediately rose and accompanied them. And when they had arrived, they took him to the upper room. And all the widows, just think about this, all the widows stood around him crying and displaying undershirts, tunics, and other garments, such as Dorcas was accustomed to make while she was with them. She didn't know this day was going to come. But she was just about to experience the supernatural power of God in her life. But she was just consistent. A woman who 
I was invested in good works. She would do this and do this and do this. And this time came when all these people, it was like uh, the way the Holy Spirit was sort of helping to appreciate this was, you know, that it comes to a time when, you know, the, you're, 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 you're consistent in doing the things that, you know, God is prompting your heart to do in being a blessing to people. And then all of that aggregates and just translates into some experience in your life that anybody, you know, it just uh, um, suddenly, you know, shocks everybody. The Bible says when your cloud is full, they will empty themselves on the earth. Your good works are like seeds. You just continue to fill your cloud. Continue to fill your cloud. So the Bible says here that, and, and uh, such as Dorcas was accustomed to make what she was with them. So but Peter put them all out of the room and knelt down and prayed and turning to the body said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes and she saw Peter and raised herself and sat upwards. Praise God. Let me say this as I wrap up. We need to recognize that uh, when God created us in his image and after his likeness, he put in us all the qualities and attributes that will cause us to succeed just like him. All that God saw when he formed us was that we were to represent him on this earth. This, the kingdom of this earth was supposed to be managed and driven by us. And so he, he, he coded into us everything, uh, both hardware and software that was required for us to succeed. And the Bible describes the very, uh, the essence of the software, if you like, as love, because that's who God is. The Bible says, beloved, let's love one another, for God is love, and everyone that loves is born of God. God doesn't have love. God is love. So when the Bible says he made us in his image and after his likeness, we were made as love beings. You are, you are not optimized when you don't love. When you are not invested in being a blessing to other people, you don't function at your best. Think about it. At times when you're frustrated, you're unhappy, um, you, you're, you're, you're struggling with meaning and, and fulfillment and that, those, those uh, elements of what you call subjective well-being. You know what I mean? There's no metrics. You can't really measure it. But you know inside you that I'm just not feeling well. I'm not, I'm not excited. I'm, 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 I'm unhappy. The factors that drive uh, those things are not things that you can't. It's not money. It's not material wealth. They are the intangibles. You know, selflessness, empathy, um, caring for other people, you know. And, you know, when you don't pay attention to those things, because that is how you are wired, you, you are like a, like, like, you become like a device that is malfunctioning, that is not, that is not running the way it's meant to war on. Because God functions on love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, God is love. You know, um, he's, he's a father of light. There, there, there is in him no, no shadow of vari variableness. The Bible says, you know, God is consistent in that space. And because we are made in his image and after his likeness, we are made to function like that. So when we choose otherwise because of the, uh, uh, the, the environment, the culture, our flesh, you find out that you are not optimized. And therefore, the, the coding, uh, you know, the, the, your, how God has wired you to succeed you begin to function. Uh, you, you, you begin to function out of order, and when you begin to, you know, malfunction, then the, you are not able to uh, achieve real, true success. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So, success, good success, fulfilling your purpose in life is not supposed to be so tedious. It's not supposed to be complicated. You know, it is hinged on obedience to God and a consistent love work. When you, are, when you are like that, you are, you are optimized. The power of God flows free. The Bible says, convert NSC the best gift, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in verse 13, it says, I show you, I mean, the last verse, it says, and I show you the more excellent way. And it goes and talks about love. And you want to see the fullness of the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in your life. Just walk in love. There is no, you don't have to pray in tongues uh, 100, uh, 24 hours a day. It's not for show. It's not for anything. It flows based on love. If I love people, I will see God's God's best manifest through my life. I will be optimized as a believer. God will use me and God will promote me and he will elevate me. Praise God. That is, that is how uh, the kingdom of God operates. And so the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 verse 5, it says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So God knowing that that is how we we are meant to succeed. He has given us the Holy Spirit. And now, apart from the fact that we are wired uh, in God's image and after his likeness and we are, we are of his nature, we are of his love nature, he's now giving us the Holy Spirit and the love of God has been 
poured in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, we are further enabled to walk in love. Meaning that we can place a demand on that love when we feel we are, we are at our own wit's end. And the Holy Spirit supplies it. Hallelujah. And so we are without excuse. You can do it. You can do it. And the other day I was meditating on Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And I, I, need, I need to make a confession here. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. I used to read it as the fruits of the Spirit. And I have actually found myself teaching how uh, you can be good in some fruits and some other fruits. And so uh, the fruit of patience, I have the fruit of patience. Uh, but I don't have the fruit of uh, maybe kindness or long suffering, something like that. You know, you just start teaching. So recognize the fruits that you have not grown and start trusting God for you because some fruits. But the, God started helping me to see that they are not fruits. He said the fruit is one. The fruit of the love. So I got a bit confused. I I am not sure. I now understand what this. So I I started reading also commentaries and just studying around it. And uh, I, it wasn't helping me so much. So I, 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 I paused and said to God, just show me what exactly you mean by this. And he said, I, I, I just had this moment of illumination and it was very liberating for me. Very, very liberating. He said, when you pick an apple, you say, an apple is round, is juicy, is, is maybe crunchy, right? Is, and all those other things, right? Hallelujah. I need the fruit of patience to cope with it. Okay, so, so, but you get what I'm saying. So, an apple is what? Is, is, maybe it's red, it's crunchy, it's juicy, it's, it's whatever, it's tasty and all of that. You are, def- you are describing just one apple. But those are the attributes of the apple. So, you said to me that the fruit of the spirit is, those are the qualities. So, when you have Spirit, you are supposed to possess all those things love, patience, kindness, goodness. But he said to me, You know, what you need to recognize is that you are meant to place a demand on the Holy Spirit to help you manifest those qualities. So, whether you have it or not, when you are, when you are faced with a situation, you have the capacity to manifest all of those attributes consistently. Don't say, I, I have patience, but I don't have kindness. I have kindness. No, you, you have all of it because it's the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm like, wow, that is awesome. So I need to stop excusing myself by saying, I have this one, but I'm yet to go with this one. If you have one, you're supposed to be able to manifest all. If it is actually the fruit of the Spirit, if you have one, you have all. And so what I'm saying to you is that you can do it. Because the Bible says the love of, of God has been poured up, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables it. So if you, you're saying, I'm struggling my love work now, I'm saying, just lean on the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to help you. Ask him to open your eyes. Ask him to uh, uh, show you and give you the opportunities to begin to take steps in the direction of love. And you'll be amazed how good works will naturally flow from you, both in the workplace and outside the workplace. Who has received anything tonight? I want to just put your hands together and celebrate God for his word. Amen. Can I pray very quickly with someone today? Um, as I do that, I'll ask everyone else in the congregation. I don't know what this message means to you, uh, but I, I, I just wanted to say, Lord, I, I receive your word this, this evening uh, with a very obedient heart. And this is, these are the areas where I, I struggle. This is the perspective I, I know I, I need to deal with in the workplace. And I, and I trust you uh, for help. I trust you that you will strengthen my spirit and enable me to mortify the desires of my flesh such that your will uh, will be done in my life. Uh, and while you say that prayer, I just want to pray with someone here who is not born again. You don't know God. You have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I want to challenge you tonight. Uh, this is your opportunity. If Jesus were to come tonight, you know that you are not going to be with him because you are either backsliding or you've just not uh, known him as your Lord and Savior. Would you put your right hand on your heart? I want to pray very quickly with you. God's love is abundant in this place. He wants to transform your life. He wants to save you. He wants to be your Lord and Savior and King. Please put your right hand on your heart. I'm going to pray with you very, very quickly. Uh, God bless you for your obedience. God bless you for your uh, willingness to, to surrender your life to him and watch him transform your life forever. I can assure you this is the best decision you'll be making uh, in your life. Please put your right hand on your heart. I will pray with you very quickly. Praise God. Hallelujah. If your right hand is on your heart, would you just uh, do me one, uh, one big, big favor? Uh, lift up your left hand. I want to see you. I know that you're saying this prayer tonight. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone joining those whose hands are already up? 
uh, I, I want you to be bold tonight. This is one decision you will forever be grateful for. Uh, this is not time to be shy. I want you to be really bold about this decision. Hallelujah. Would you say this prayer after me? Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I, I repent of my sins. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die for me. And you raised him up for my justification. I declare Jesus as my personal Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Father, for saving me. Thank you for washing me clean with the precious blood of your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for everyone under the influence of this service who has said this prayer. We destroy the hold of sin over their lives. I declare in the name of Jesus that they are translated from darkness into light and that they are established in your courts and that their life brings forth fruits to the praise of a glorious name. We give you praise, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. If you said the